Um, at some point in everybody's life, I believe that we have to step out of our own closets. So right now I'm going to step out of my closet. I'll tell you why in a second. <laughs> kind of made that up. Um, it does have some influences from Miles Davis. You probably heard a little bit of um, solar in that, right? Um, so yes, um, over the last couple of decades in my life, um, my music and my science rarely spoke to each other. Um, and if they did, it was very indirect. And so when the opportunity came, okay, and a lot of the, a, a lot of the reason for that is actually because when I, at least when I was growing up, and I grew up in the Bronx, actually, and would watch a lot of, thank you very much, yes, Dewood Clinton High School. Uh, so, you know, a lot of things, the images I saw were usually like, you know, old dudes in, in lab coats, um, not really enjoying their lives in a lab in the basement somewhere, and on the science side, and you know, science being this very logical, stringent thing with, with facts and um, with a kid, a, you know, a kid with a, a big imagination, you, it may not be too attractive, maybe, maybe not. And then on the music side, um, I grew up in the 80s, so there were a lot of like hip-hop guys, and like, you know, it's usually when you think music, you know, you think music is a very emotional kind of thing. Music is a language of emotion. So it makes sense that my music and my love for music and, you know, what I do to music and what I did as a scientist, that I actually kept them away, actually, from each other. All right. But, you know, as you know, um, I see some young people in the audience, at some point, you're going to have to answer to your true nature, to what your true, you know, whatever that thing is. And I knew I wanted, there was something about music and my science, there's something about them that I wanted them to speak to each other. And so when I had the opportunity, now I'm going to fast forward way into the future, you know, from adolescence to now, right after my PhD, I had the opportunity to stay in America and train as a scientist here, as a physicist, or to go to um, Imperial College in London. Um, and my face is sweating, so thank you very much. Um, I feel much better now. Um, <clears throat> I was not struggling about being a model or anything like that. You don't know, have to worry about that kind of stuff. Um, so, so I decided to go to Imperial. And deep down, it was because I was going to have a double life. When I got to London, I ended up getting involved in the underground music scene, because London was a place where a lot of music um, from the underground, like garage music, drum and bass, um, there's a, a big mix up of, of different sounds and a big, you know, a lot of open, the Asian Dub Foundation. So when I got to London, you know, by, by then actually, if you look at some old pictures, I had very long dreadlocks, and, and I had a pseudonym, my music pseudonym became Solo. All right, 
you know, uh, my middle name is Solomon. It wasn't that I'm like a cool guy, like solo, like solo to my sax or anything like that. Um, but that's what people thought, and I didn't, you know, you know, rebuke. So, so at nighttime, I would, you know, run off to the to the clubs, Ministry of Sound, Fabric, you know, Cargo. Yes, right, yeah. And I used to play with um with an outfit, DJ Dado, and the Soliel Sound System. I don't know if you guys know these people. Okay. But anyway, I used to play my sax on stage bareback you know, when I had a six-pack. Now my name is Tupac for sure, you know what I'm saying? And um, so I used to like, you know, get on stage, you know, thousands of people raving and all that stuff. My sax, dreadlocks, you know, solo, you know, with diesel leather pants. Remember those leather pants, diesel ones? I will never wear those again, and I don't have dreadlocks. I have tenure. Um, I will not do that. Um, the point is, I. Can you imagine me going for tenure with leather pants, walking in the tenure, tenure committee? Right. So um, that's a whole nother, if they invite me back, I'll tell you the story of my grandmother telling me to cut my dreadlocks off. Uh, that's an interesting one. So um, yeah, so that was my sect, this other life I had. And in fact, it got so bad, I was living such a lie um, that there was this woman that I really fell head over heels for. I mean, she was a model, OK? And she would never. Right, fall for a physicist. So I just kind of told a half lie. So what do you do? Uh, I'm a musician. I know some of you have done that kind of stuff, you know, like, what do you, I'm a musician, I play the sax. So every time we go out, I'm the sax guy with my case, you know. Um, of course, and one day, this is like weeks later, we're hanging out, and my case opens up, and a bunch of like string theory papers f fly out. And she's like, what's that? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, it's, so I'm, I'm actually working on the philosophy of jazz improvisation and its connection to string theory. Okay, dude, you're, you're a physicist, get out of here. Um, so during the daytime, I was actually dressed, you know, put my black stuff on and march into my office at Imperial College in London, which was in the sanctum of string theory back in those days. There was a lot of like really brilliant people, much more brilliant than me. And um, I used to go and do my stuff with those guys, calculate and work on string theory and cosmology and that kind of stuff. And again, I didn't really feel like the way those guys were doing it, it really didn't jive with me, you know? But there was something about, they did, something about the way they were doing physics that I wanted to bear to light, that I wasn't aware of at the time, and now I was. Now I am. They were improvising. So a lot of you, when we think about things like physics, you think it's this rote, you know, logical process. But when physicists like Albert Einstein and Richard Feynman actually create these great grand ideas that our technology enjoy, right, it's coming from a very irrational sometimes process, leaps and bounds of crazy imaginations and speculations. And that's very similar to actually what I just did there on that horn. I just walked up there and I just speculated away. And there were some things I played there that sucked, right? And there was maybe a trinket of something that sounded interesting. And what jazz musicians did in the 40s at Mitten's Playhouse was they paid attention to those little things, those little snippets, and that became bebop jazz. That's exactly what Albert Einstein realized. That's exactly what Feynman realized, those little snippets and moments of improvisation. Okay? And that's what's in common between jazz and physics. But that's actually the first half of my, of my um, story. The second half gets a little bit more interesting. Because you see, um, Imperial had some interesting people, and one interesting person was a good, who became a very dear friend of mine, his name is Lee Smolin. Um, he also writes a lot of science books. And Lee was considering a job at Imperial, and he had a little party at his place. And I just want to read a little from this, um, so that you buy the book. <laughs> and so this, I walk into this party, and he had a place in Kensington. Everyone had his or her favorite drink in hand, there were bubbles and deep reds, and the sound of ice clinking in cocktail glasses underlay the hum of contented chatter. Grace in the room were slender women with long hair and handsome men, and men dressed in black suits with glints of gold necklaces and cufflinks. But this was no great Gatsby affair. It was the annual Imperial College Quantum Gravity Cocktail or Hour. <laughs> right, so, all right. And um, my, new, my new friend, Lee Smolin, invited Faye Dowker, who was a professor, one of the Stephen Hawkins students, to give that lecture one day at the Quantum Gravity Cocktail. While Faye gave her living room lecture, I honed in on someone else I had noticed throughout the evening. Dressed in black like Lee Smolin, he had a strong face and a gold tooth. 
that's shown every time someone engaged him in conversation. The way he listened to Faye with such focus, I assume he was a hardcore Russian theorist. I just flew in from Moscow, actually, this morning. It turned out he had come with Lee. When Lee noticed I was hanging out after the talk, he invited me to join them, and Lee walked his gold-toothed friend back to his studio in Notting Hill Gate. That was my first encounter with Brian Eno. What is Brian Eno doing at a quantum gravity cocktail hour? What is this guy that produces, right, U2 and Dune and everything, right? This guy, what's he doing at a quantum gravity cocktail hour? So Brian ended up becoming a mentor of mine, a friend. I mean, we're still friends up to today. In fact, I, whatever, he, uh, he's a good friend. And, um, and one of the things that would happen, Brian is a big fan of bicycles. He and David Byrne are friends, as you know. And they're avid fans of, of using bicycles. And he had two bikes, and he gave me a bike for the time I lived at, in, in London. So I used to use this bike. And before going to work, which I was very nervous about going to work because it was a competitive environment, okay? Like super smart guys trying to you know, topple you over being smarter, more clever, knowing more math and all this stuff. So before I would do that, I would just go to Brian's studio, hang out with him, um, and drink tea. And, and Brian was kind of like, he's a funny guy. He would get up and say, hey, you are in his British accent. I still don't have a British accent mastered. Shame on me. Um, maybe. So um, he would, you know, he would basically start playing like a Marvin Gaye song and start dancing to the Marvin Gaye song. And, um, but over time, I realized that, again, Brian's process was not like what I expected artists to be like. One day, I walk in to his studio, and he's mesmerized on a gigantic computer screen with what looks like basically what a kindergarten kid is doing. Literally, there are little square boxes, a few of them, different colors, and he is moving them around and getting excited about it. Ooh, this is really good. He didn't know I was there, by the way, because his door was open. I just walk in. Um, some, some, some other interesting person lived next to Brian. That I, I won't mention his name, but there were cops there all the time. All right, so it's interesting that Brian would leave his door open all the time. That's interesting. So, it's not open all the time anyway, so just in case Brian is watching this, don't get pissed off, dude. Um, so he's looking at this stuff. I come the next day. He's still involved in this, in, in, in this, in this square stuff. I'm like, dude, can I get you some Lego? I mean, get the real stuff, you know? He's getting to the stuff. Um, so finally, he expresses to me, he says, oh, you know, um, it's kind of interesting that this, um, these blocks here, they, there are different rules, very simple rules that these blocks have about the next block that's to occur, that's to appear right after it or next to it. They're really simple rules. And based on these simple rules, you get all of this beauty and complexity. Okay? Now, at the time, I thought that this guy was, he lost it. Okay? I was like, okay, this guy's gone bonkers. Like, what about all this beautiful music that he made, all, all this complicated stuff that he's done? What's he doing now? Well, of course, a decade later, that became known as you know, generative art. All right? um, he did like some crazy painting stuff, a, a million or five billion paintings, and every painting is different. That was, the, that was a germ of that idea. And so what that really inspired me, um, in terms of my struggles at the time, which was living this double life as a musician, and, 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 a, and, a, and, a, um, and a physicist in this case, and being so you know, insecure in a, in a sense, about what others thought, was that I realized that what Brian was doing with his stuff was he, he would take an idea from science and he would make it into art and he wouldn't give a damn what anybody thought about it. And that he had like, done that with his career. So that really inspired me to say, you know what? I'm just gonna do the following thing. So the next time I was on a sabbatical, I was on sabbatical at Princeton down the street. I didn't live on campus, I lived here. And I produced an album with a hipster in Brooklyn, some young hipster guy, right? And that was my album. When I teach my quantum mechanics classes now, I come up with all, I conjure all sorts of musical analogies. Now my students think I'm, they think I'm crazy. And of course, writing this book, um, this book was really a, uh, what's the word, a cathartic experience, a, a way of reconciling these two ways of thinking 
to really realize it's kind of like one way of thinking about both of, of two things. Um, so yeah, so that's, um, there is, is there time? No, it's minus two seconds. So, you know, one, one of the problems that physicists have not solved yet, young man, is the problem of time. So I'm out of here. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>